So this month's PF topic for the NSDA is Resolve, for-profit prisons in the United States should be banned. Fairly straightforward topic, fairly short topic. Again, we're going to start wording arguments overall strategy. So because the topic is so short, there's only two terms that you don't see in most public forum topics. For-profit prisons, which should almost always be defined together rather than individually, and banned. So, for-profit prisons can be defined narrowly or broadly. The question really becomes, does it refer to the facilities or does it refer to the corporations? If it refers to the corporations, then it also involves services in a bunch of other types of prisons, in a bunch of other types of correctional centers, in a bunch of other areas of the justice system. So, when you're looking at prisons in particular, that is a limiting term that is specifically excluding jails, it is excluding immigration detention centers, it is excluding youth correctional facilities, it is specifically focusing only on prisons. If you're talking about them as the companies, that is broadening a little bit, and talking about contract work that for-profit prisons happen to do elsewhere. So, again, that part of it is fairly straightforward. Well, could certainly argue that all prisons are in some way for profit, but usually for hyphen profit specifically refers to something that is not a non profit, that has shareholders, that has a board of directors, that exists for the purpose of maximizing its stakeholders' profits. So, while you could certainly make an argument that there are ways that other prisons that exist are for somebody's profit, they are probably not for hyphen profit prisons defined collectively in a way that would actually make reason for the topic committee to add for profit to the resolution at all. So while one team or the other could choose to go broad with that, neither one necessarily wants to. Aside from that, banned is stronger than reformed probably not quite as strong as abolish. Something could be banned and then brought back later theoretically, but then that would be suspended if it was banned with the intent to bring back later. Ban usually implies permanent intent, even if not permanent results. Khan really can't argue that banned only means temporary, and if Pro does, then Khan wants to concede that, because that really hurts Pro's case, because all of the harms that they are talking about, all of the drawbacks of these, are probably going to come back anyway, if the idea is, well, we can fix them, we should bring them back. So while Pro could theoretically go down that route with Band, I don't think Pro wants to. I don't think Khan is capable of starting out down that route, but I think if Pro tries to take them there, they should let them and collect the win. That said, unless that happens, I think this is a topic that really helps out Pro more than Khan from an offense-defense paradigm. And what I mean by that is are way more arguments why for-profit prisons are bad than that they are good, and way more arguments that are comparatively worse than state-run prisons than arguments that they are better than state-run prisons. This means that if a Khan team goes into the debate thinking this debate is about whether for-profit prisons are good or bad, that con team, the vast majority of the time, is going to lose that debate decisively just because the evidence for that doesn't really exist. There's lots of evidence out there for for-profit contractors replacing government services being efficient in general, but most of those do not apply to welfare or to prisons, specifically because the whole idea behind them is customer choice and a free market, which doesn't really apply here at all. And by that I mean nobody's going to say, oh, I'm being abused in this prison, I would like to give my business to this other prison instead. They're pretty much stuck with whatever prison the government puts them in. There's no freedom of choice between customers to go back and forth. They are literally a captive audience. Most of these arguments do not apply to an unfree market. And you can certainly say the customer is the government and not the prisoners, but that just shows where a lot of the problems from this would come. Because when the government is the customer, they care about cost, they care about staying out of the headlines. There was, I want to say it was Idaho that recently canceled its contract with Corrections Corporation of America, CCA. 
because it had learned about gladiatorial fights for money that had been put on by prison guards in the prison for years, forcing inmates to fight each other, sometimes to the death, and eventually somebody snuck a camera in and talked about it, and then they were enough of an embarrassment that they finally dropped the contract. But at the same time, that's not something that says, oh, well, as long as you've got freedom of choice, you've got competition, you've got customer choice, you have a free market, you can avoid that. So I don't think that's necessarily a direction that wants to be gone down. Without that, though, the offensive arguments for Khan are kind of limited. They can get offense by trying to turn certain things on recidivism. They can get offense on overcrowding, as long as they emphasize short-term over long-term. But other than that, there is not too much that the con can do playing offense on this topic. And really, that's where the word banned comes in. Because most of your judges are not going to be looking at this on their flows in an offense-defense paradigm. They're going to be looking at it in terms of, should these be banned or not. Crow's burden in front of a smart con team is to show that these are so far beyond redemption that the only solution is to get rid of them entirely instead of fixing them. Not, are they good? Not, are they better than state-run prisons? Are they so much better, so are they so much worse than state-run prisons that we need to get rid of all of them rather than trying to fix some of them? that even if we did try to fix some of them, it would not be worth the other cost associated with it, and that somehow getting rid of all of these and the crisis of what do we do then is outweighed by the existing systemic harms. And I think that that's a little bit harder for Pro to do. So let's look at two of those things in a little more detail. We're going to look at the systemic harms, and we're going to look at the what happens when we close them, because that's a debate that's going to happen in a lot of crossfires, but not in enough cases. Because if you ban these outright, banning might imply a timetable, it might imply immediately, it's a question of should be, not will be, or how will it be, but when you're talking about this kind of banning, you're talking more than anything else about probably reducing the capacity of the prison system. Now, whether that means they get taken over by state-run prisons, whether that means that they close down entirely, is certainly up for grabs. If they close down entirely, then either side can claim benefits or harms off of certain people being let go and put into alternative treatment, or just let out on probation. There's a lot of different ways that that can go, depending on who would be let go and why. If it's simply a case of transferring, then that puts Pro in an awkward position in terms of the numbers game, where, okay, so right now, let's say the bottom 50% of prison guards in terms of quality, in terms of effectiveness, and in terms of safety for themselves and the prisoners, worked for CCA and Geo Group. Even if that were the case, then if you close them down, take control of their prisons, and then higher guards, you're probably getting those same guards or ones of comparable or lower quality back anyway. So if you're keeping the size of the system the same, and the bottom 50% of the system is the problem, then changing the ownership of it might not actually change that. So this is one of many areas where Khan can play defense on this topic. Khan can also punish Pro for being overly broad in some of their claims. Namely that a lot of harms Pro mentions will also apply to state-run prisons as well, albeit to a lesser extent than for-profit prisons. And when you're in that kind of situation, it's a lot harder to show that this justifies a ban when it is happening elsewhere too and needs to be reformed in both cases. So I think in most rounds, the primary clash is going to end up being reformism versus abolition, the question is, how are teams going to get there, through which harms and which examples? So, there's a couple ways to look at this. One is recidivism. How often a prison who is released from prison gets convicted of a crime and sent back. Generally speaking, the argument here deals with the profit incentives that for perfect prisons would rather have increased recidivism, that they make more money when people come back afterwards. 
The argument on the other side is going to be that you can give them financial incentives to reduce recidivism, and with a profit incentive, they will be able to reduce it effectively. The second argument that you'll see a lot is this idea of corruption and minimum occupancy contracts. The idea that for for profit prison to be a reasonable venture, you have to be sure that it's going to be full. So the contracts that the government signs says, we will give you at least this many prisoners, and if not, we owe you fines. At that point, there's an incentive to send people to prison. There's an incentive to not give people probation. There's an incentive not to send people to rehab. There's an incentive not to send people to a mental hospital. There's an incentive, anytime you have a chance, to fill one of those slots, to fill those slots, because otherwise you will get fined more for not sending someone to prison than it would cost you to send them to prison. In a world absent for-profit prisons, it's generally considered to be a costly last resort to send someone to prison simply because of how expensive that is. For-profit prisons will shave some of the overhead costs off of that in a couple of different ways, but at the same time, if they guarantee that you will always have more and more people needing to go to prison, then that can certainly balance that out, and then some. Again, it is a question of short-term versus long-term on that one. Another argument that often comes up is mental health, both in terms of substance abuse disorders and addiction, and other mental health disorders in general. When you're talking about mental health on this topic, you need to realize that over half the prisoners in the United States have some kind of mental health issues. Many had them before going to prison, some developed them while in prison, but in nearly all of those cases, somebody with a mental health issue could have, in the past, before the advent of for-profit prisons, been sent someone that specializes in dealing with mental health issues, rather than specializes in holding them out of the way for a long time, letting them go with a criminal record and a mental health disorder and an inability to do anything about either of those or hold down a job, which usually means they go right back into another for-profit prison. This also creates some coercive ideas in terms of sentencing. In particular, prosecutors are encouraged to pursue things that lead directly to prison time. Judges are encouraged to sentence more directly to prison time. This is often encouraged indirectly, occasionally is encouraged directly. Pennsylvania had a scandal a couple years back where several judges were being paid by the person to send high school students into for-profit prisons. This also leads into lobbying, which is where this can kind of get into a different kind of political argument. Because for-profit prisons have a huge lobby. Generally speaking, this is a lobby that is going to oppose things like immigration reform, oppose things like decriminalization on drugs, and generally is going to support things like mandatory minimum sentences, and is going to support things like vagrancy statutes, criminalization of being homeless or feeding the homeless, so on and so forth. Anything that's going to put more people in prisons, they're going to support. Anything that results in fewer people being sent to prison, they're probably going to oppose. They don't really care so much about people being sent to prison for smaller amounts of time, simply because they know that in the majority of cases, if they do their job right, they'll be back. At that point, this also means that banning for-profit prisons would get rid of that lobby. Getting rid of that lobby might cause some good laws to be passed that would otherwise be blocked. It might cause some bad laws to be repealed that are otherwise firmly entrenched. Both sides could claim indirect benefits or harms off of those laws and the effect that the absence of this particular lobby would have on the U.S.'s political system, particularly in regards to immigration reform and decriminalization. Aside from that, safety is another argument that can be made. You can get into this through mental health, you can get into this through corruption, but it can also be an argument in and of itself in terms of either the guards, or the population surrounding, or the inmates themselves, incentives to cut corners on safety in for-profit prisons are a place that Pro can find a decent amount of evidence. And again, that Khan would just need to play defense and argue this can be reformed, but it's probably not going to find any others there actually safer. Aside from that, 
Let's see. The two biggest things to talk about in a fairly short survey of this topic are going to be, well, obviously race, which is the elephant in the room here that I haven't gotten to yet. But aside from that, the other thing that you might want to talk about specifically when you are talking about for-profit prisons... Actually, you know, I'll come back to that because it's cyclical, and as a result, it's probably easiest dealt with after I talk about race. So, when for-profit prisons create an incentive to put more people in jail, to have higher sentences for certain crimes, to send more people away, this almost always results in disproportionate levels of non-white populations being sent to jail, in particular black people. This is true across all prisons. It is even truer in for-profit prisons. The idea becomes, we need warm bodies to fill these prisons for profit, whose bodies are disposable, and statistically speaking, the vast majority of the time in America, that's going to mean black people. It is also going to mean Native Americans, it is also going to mean Hispanic people, but the vast majority of the time you're talking about a country in which one in three adult black males will spend some portion of their life in prison. You're talking about a country where, in anonymous surveys, whites admit to higher amounts of drug use or higher frequency of drug use for the same drugs, are punished for it less, and when they are punished for it, are sent to rehab instead of prisons. The idea is not that for profit prisons are, in and of themselves, explicitly racist and have it out against black people, but they are perfectly content to profit off of racism in a way that also increases it and causes vicious cycles. That said, let's talk about this last idea, which is the prison industrial complex. Basically, the difference between an industry and an industrial complex is it is a self-feeding, positive feedback loop. It is a cycle. The defense industry became the military-industrial complex. The corrections facilities became a prison-industrial complex. The idea here is that it constantly creates a need for more prisoners, which creates a need for more prisons, which creates a need for more prisons, which creates a need for more prisons, in a way that people can't really get out of. This is, by and large, the biggest reason that Khan is going to have a hard time finding offensive literature on the topic, because the reasons that for profit prisons actually exist have very little to do with their benefits and very much to do with their political expediency. The evidence that Khan can find is almost always going to be written by somebody who has been paid by either Geo Group or CCA, which together control 75% of all for-profit prisons in the USA. The idea behind this is, again, that it's taken things over in terms of local corruption, in terms of national politics, in terms of lobbying, in terms of how it affects mental health services, how it reduces them, how it trades off with them, how it hurts people who are supposed to be receiving mental health services, how it hurts providers are supposed to be giving those but are having people who they would be giving them to sent to prison instead, how it hurts our juvenile justice system, how it hurts our immigration policy, all of these tie together with the result of creating more prisoners to create more prisons to create more prisoners. And again, I don't think this is something that Khan necessarily wants to say no to on this topic in front of the vast majority of judges. Even among fairly conservative lay judges, for-profit prisons are not popular. The general argument among leaders that I've heard talking with people about this is just not that they're good, but that who cares, once they've gone to prison, their rights don't matter anyway, which, even if it were true, still makes many other things easy tiebreakers for the pro side. So, at that point, I think the answer isn't no, they don't, but yes, but. Yes, but they can be fixed. Yes, but a complete overhaul wouldn't do any better. Yes, but they were only built because the government couldn't handle those kinds of numbers in the first place. And just going from there and showing that even if some do need to be closed down, if others need to be regulated more, then the solution is to work within the system and to fix it there, rather than to burn it to the ground. And again, Pro's argument shouldn't just be why they are bad, or why there's something uniquely about their for-profit nature that makes them bad, that makes them either A, beyond redemption, 
or B, would significantly improve if they were taken over by the state and that for-profit nature no longer is driving that particular kind of decision. If you are con on this topic, you should always be second. If you are debating under CFL rules, you will be second. If you are debating under NFL rules, NSDA rules, then if the other team picks pro, you get to pick second. If you get to pick side, pick side. That said, that also means that Khan can wait to hear pros' points before they decide what to play defense on, what to turn, and how to frame the debate. I think that having put thought into things that are not your contentions, thoughts into what will the implementation look like, where will people who are in this go, who would be let go, would anybody be let go, why, what effect would that have on society, what effect is this going to have on the other ventures of these companies that are not directly prisons? Those are things that you want to consider even though you do not go in your case because they're going to be crucial to the crossfires on this topic. There's a ton more I could talk about on this, but at the same time, this is supposed to be a brief survey. There's certainly been longer stuff of mine up on this topic in other places that many of you have already seen from the first week of November, second week of November. So, this is more just a survey for the other people who don't have access to those to give you a brief idea of what the topic is about, what the main areas of Clash are, and hopefully it has helped with that.